मैडम चंद्रिक मोहन मै डियर सीनियर from cpcra regional station kayankulam she is principal scientist and uh, she has experience spanning uh, over around 27 28 years if i am right ma'am uh, her uh, area specialization is bio biological control of pets and she brought uh, lot many laurels to the institute in terms of academic awards and uh, other recognitions as well so uh, uh, make use of her time on our also and uh, get maximum uh, out of uh, such an eminent uh, researcher so it's all uh, your floor ma'am uh, you can start off now there is just a formal uh, way i have to introduce that's why <laughs> just i told okay. them okay ma'am okay. i can uh, attempt uh, sharing your slides now okay Sixteen. Uh, 
Hello, is my uh, uh, screen is uh, okay, Deshagar? Screen is visible, ma'am. Very clear. Test oh, management coconut. Oh, okay. Is it a slideshow now? I think it's a slideshow mode. Slideshow. Okay. No, uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, my dear Jay Shagar and uh, my colleagues from CPCRI Kasaragod and uh, my dear students from different parts of the country, a very good afternoon to all of you. So uh, the topic given to me by Jay Shagar is pest management in coconut, I reckon it in cocoa. And you may be knowing why I have selected these three crops alone, because uh, these are the three mandate crops of ICR CPCRI. You might have had so many sessions before this one. So I am also dealing with the pest management in these three crops for, uh, for a discussion with you today. My name is Chandrika Mohan. I am working as principal scientist at uh, one of the regional station of CPCRI at a place called Kayangulam. Okay, then coming to the, before going to my topic, I would like to know because how many of you are interested in insects, because you are, all of you are final year uh, uh, BSc graduates. So I want to kindle some kind of an interest in you in, uh, of course, in insects. That is my area of specialization. Insects are so fascinating, isn't it? The diversity of both form and behavior of insect is amazing. And the photograph, what you are seeing here is all insects only. So why we call all these as insects, first of all? These are uh, looking so different and we all call all these as insects. So what is the uniqueness of insects? Insects have chitinous exoskeleton, that is the number one character. They are six-legged arthropods with two pair of wings, three body tagmata. These are the three major characters by which we call an organism as an insect. I just want to refresh your memory because all this you had studied in your graduate course and I just want to refresh it. And uh, the most important thing is that the immature stages and adults occupy a very diverse niche. And uh, from everywhere it is there, in the Rocky Mountains and then in the sea, everywhere it is there. And how they respirate, tracheal respiration and the excretion through malpigian tubules. So, so these are the uh, preliminary aspect we have to remember when we talk about insects. And coming to the uh, insect biotic balance, uh, of course, I am just dealing with a part of it here, pest of crop plants alone. But you see the insects are vectors of pathogens. They lot many are beneficial insects like pollinators, pest managers, source of chemical and medicine, products of commercial use. So you uh, always we need not have to think of insect as a crop pest because uh, in the uh, in the our ecosystem uh, so many services the insects are doing just like our uh, pollinators and so many others. So but uh, we have to control the insect to feed the ever increasing population and to avoid starvation. We must devise effective measures to manage our insects. And in annual crop loss in India was estimated to about 113,800 crores, of which 26% are due to plant diseases. And here you can see the insects cost 20% of crop loss. So why we call an organism as a pest? What is the simplest definition of a pest? Any organism that is deleterious to man and his possessions we call as a pest. So uh, in your uh, entomology course, you might have studied so many pests because we have a diversity. We, India is very rich in biodiversity. And in the diverse crops, diverse insects are there. So it's very difficult to uh, always to remember their scientific names, isn't it? So why an insect attain the uh, status of a pest? What is so simple organism, so beautiful organism, how they attain the status of a pest? There are so many, broadly when we divide it into, there are so many reasons. One is invasions. That is actually they were, uh, they were not existing in our country. So it, they become this to, through some or the other reason like international travel. Uh, we know that it is very rapid and uh, uh, only because of now the COVID-19 restrictions. Otherwise international trade and travel was very much uh, there. So, Along with that, uh, the baggage and along with the, those things, a lot many insects entered our country also, then e-commerce. Then another major aspect is the ecological changes. Intensive agriculture, and we try to kill whatever is there on our way. When we are intensifying agriculture, some insect is there, our prime aim is to kill that one. So 
some other insect may be there that may be a predator that also get uh, wiped out from the ecosystem monocultures and uh, uh, biodiversity simplifications so many are that those many policy matters are there but uh, we have to think why these poor organism become a pest then selection of hiding plants that particular plant you may be knowing about the bengal famine and so many things like that eliminating competitors by agrotechnics then human interventions and uh, there is another aspect socio economic change also consumer habits and taste for that a particular variety of a crop is very much uh, moving in the market then all the farmers will uh, tend to multiply that one only or cultivate that one so uh, so many uh, aspects are there why in uh, population of an organism become the pest, attain the pest status then how to tell what are eating our plants so for that we have to be the plant doctors no other choice so we you are now in agri graduate so you are the plant doctors so you have to, you should develop that diagnostic skill within you there are plenty of potential culprits and uh, just uh, so many ways to stop them also so we learn one by one what are the major pests coming to our mandate crops so for a pest manager there are different options broadly when we classify they are chemical pesticides as well as biological control options and we all know because this is the major thing taught in the graduate level classes that uh, what are the harmful environmental pollution harmful effect of chemical pesticides and all and what are the beneficial uh, effect of biological controls so uh, this just broadly i had mentioned the broad spectrum quick action Uh, long residual effect high yield and all these are the positive flags of chemical pesticides but there are environmental and health problems but when we come to biocontrol agents they are target specific one agent we can apply for a particular organism only very slow effect today you apply you will not, you will not get any uh, any effect uh, within a week or even sometimes within a month but they are self sustainable very less or no residue environment safety is there and ecological sustainability is there so that is the major aspect whenever we are going for a management of a pest to the maximum extent we are trying for biological control but all the crop pest we cannot apply biological control why for a what is a biological control managing a pest using its natural enemies broadly natural enemy may be parasite predators or pathogens so there should be a proven natural enemy for a particular pest for a biological control program so always there may not be a particular biocontrol agent so in that case we have to go for integrated pest management broadly we always say as ipm integrated pest management so coming to my mandate crop that is coconut lot many insects are coming and visiting coconut one or the other time of the uh, its uh, uh, growth age like from the very small seedling to the very adult palm so many insects are coming and more than 800 insects are reported from coconut visiting one or the other time but all these are not pest many are in very good terms friends only so the uh, among the pest we just count we can just count with our fingers so very few are pest like rhinoceros beetle you may be knowing red palm beetle leaf eating caterpillar then there is a, an enemy under the ground that is the white grubs then there are the areophyte mite rugo spiraling white fly very later 2016 appeared so i the, you will be having another session on ipm that will be uh, uh, my colleague will be dealing with that one so i am leaving this invasive pest for him he will be dealing uh, with the invasive pest like areophyte mite and rugo spiraling white fly and some other techniques and uh, newer uh, approaches in pest management uh, my colleague will be dealing in the your next class i think on friday but today i am dealing with the other major pest what were existing here since uh, uh, long along with coconut so you just remember about all these pest then these are our rhinoceros beetle all of you may be knowing i think there are students from north india also so uh, i just show this video for their this thing because uh, um, uh, this is the most sturdy pest 
uh, on coconut. This is known as the rhinoceros beetle, Orictus rhinoceros. So this is the ubiquitous pest and breeds in decaying organic debris. And adults are nocturnal and occurs throughout the year. And it is reported from all coconut growing tracts of the country as well as in all coconut growing countries. And here I had just marked in redding adult longevity is three to four months. Why that only marked in red? Because the adults are the damaging state. And you can see the adult longevity is so high, three to four months. So three to four months active damage stage is there. And where the, what is the kind of uh, damage it is uh, inducing on coconut? Very nursery stage, when the plants are in the nursery bed itself, sometimes rhinoceros beetle make a hole through the bold region and then it inside result in the drying and wilting and death of the seedling. And just a transplanted seedling, you can see the uh, damage to the growing part result in the crinkled or very retarded or uh, what to say, very... Um, uh, abnormal growth of the seedling. And most of that cases, the seedling dies and because some kind of a fan-like growth of these uh, growing spindle occurs and that will not uh, properly grow to a good seedling. And very rare cases, we see that the inflorescence also get dried. So what is the reason is that in coconut, every month one inflorescence is coming. So that inflorescence is supported by a petiole, coconut uh, a petiole, so that Petiole base, when that uh, uh, damage is there, that here, that hole reaches up to the inflorescence and uh, can damage that inflorescence, get in the drying up of inflorescence. Very rare cases we had seen that the rhinoceros beetle bore hole and make uh, holes into the nut also. That is the rarest case. And the most common cases are the spear leaf damage and the opened leaf shows the geometric V-shaped cuts. That is the very common thing what farmers identify rhinoceros beetle by this kind of cuts on the uh, leaves and the spear leaf chewed up fibers coming out from the spear leaf region. So these affect the photosynthesis. Of course, you know that when leaves are uh, damaged, it affects the photosynthesis and uh, almost 10% yield loss it can induce by this rhinoceros beetle damage. But more important is that there is another pest in coconut that is known as red palm weevil. That is the fatal enemy of coconut that can kill the coconut palm. So this kind of an injury by rhinoceros beetle attract the red palm weevil for egg laying. So here is an additional uh, damage that is the uh, attracting for secondary pest infestation. So this is the major symptom, but I, I just want you to remember these things. That is the uh, chewed up fibers on the spear leaf region, as well as the cuts, the geometric cuts on the uh, opened leaf, unfurled leaves. These are the two common symptoms, uh, symptoms of rhinoceros beetle infestation. Where these are coming from? Actually, in a uh, homestead coconut garden or in a coconut plantation, there will be uh, mixed farming units. So cows will be there and cow dung storage sheds will be there. So these beetles breed in the cow dung sheds as well as in the compost tanks. Now vermicomposting and organic farming and so many things are there. So in these things, the vermicompost tanks also become a breeding place for rhinoceros beetle. And Sometimes the coconut palm uh, dried up due to some pest or disease attack, lightning or, uh, you know, so uh, summer cyclone or some reason. And the stems in three to four months, it becomes the breeding ground for rhinoceros beetle. So dead coconut logs also, this beetle can breed as well as in the stems. Sometimes the farmer remove the coconut logs and uh, uh, dispose it off, but the stems remain there. And these stems also become a breeding ground for rhinoceros beetle. So mostly it is in the breeding in the vicinity of the coconut plantation itself. Then coming to the IPM strategy, mainly the rhinoceros beetle uh, management, management for Orictus rhinoceros is biocontrol. Mostly uh, it is bio-intensified IPM only. So first is mechanical hooking of beetle. I, in the previous slide I had shown you, there is a chewed up fibers will be there on the uh, 
uh, near the spear leaf region. So if that uh, chewed up fiber is little bit wet, we can make sure that the beetle is inside. Then with a mechanical hook, we can hook up, hook this beetle from this um, site. So that is the first one. Second is placing some kind of a prophylactic treatment. That is the repelling the beetles from coming to the spear leaf region. So how we can repel it? We can repel it by placing some chemical or botanical in the leaf axils. So that we in the very, very young juvenile palm, we use naphthalene balls or then little bit grown up palms, we use uh, neem cake plus sand equal amount or chloranthrinipol also is found to be very effective in leaf axle filling. And ICR CPCRA has developed a certain botanical formulation like pellet, cakes, and paste for leaf axle filling for repelling these beetles from coming and injuring the palm spear leaf region. And this method is known as prophylactic leaf axle filling. And another simple method is covering uh, this spear leaf region with some kind of a nylon mesh. Here it is a indirect trapping of the pebbles, beetles. The beetle when flies and then come to the spear leaf region, it get entangled in the mesh and we can very easily collect and destroy them. This is what I told is that the uh, uh, extracting the beetle in the spear leaf region using a beetle hook. So the beetle hook is nothing uh, but a very thin iron rod. We can insert the iron rod to the spear leaf region and you can, you can very well see here that beetle get hooked in that hook. So this is the uh, beetle hook, hooking the beetle from the infested site. Then there are some insect growth regulatory effect with the, some local weed plant. That plant is known as Clerodendron infortunatum. I had shown the photograph here also. And this plant can elicit insect growth regulatory effect in this um, rhinoceros beetle. So uh, what the farmers are doing, they are just applying this weed plant in the cow dung or composting tank. And it gets mixed up with this food material. And when the grubs happen to feed on this one, it uh, causes some kind of an insect growth regulatory effect. How it is affecting? Because it is disrupting the hormonal system of the insect. You all know that there are two kind of two major kind of hormones like egg dyson and a juvenile hormone. So these um, chemical in the clerodendron plant disrupt the hormonal. Uh, flow of the insect and cause abnormal adult or sometimes larval pupil intermediate or pupil adult intermediates also. So this is a simple method by which the farmers can uh, manage the breeding ground and destroy the beetles. Another is behavioral control. For that we are using pheromones. Trapping adult beetles in PV, we, the rhinos, you may, you may be knowing about different kind of pheromones now used in pest management tactics. And the pheromone trap, the main trap for rhinoceros beetle is a PVC pipe. And this is the PVC pipe. Yeah, it will be loaded with the pheromone and that is nanoporous delivery material. So that a slow release of the pheromone happens from the uh, uh, sachet or the tube where we are keeping this in the uh, PVC tube and we can collect the beet trapped beetles in the bottom of this tube. Another uh, major component in biological control of uh, rhinoceros beetle is metarhysium anisoplea. Metarhysium anisoplea, you may be knowing, is commonly known as green muscardine fungus or simply as GMF, green muscardine fungus. So, this variety, this particular variety of strain of metrysium uh, that is known as variety major, that is having a higher spore size, 10 to 14 micrometer, is highly infective on rhinoceros grubs. You can see the how the spores look like. Metrysium spores look like dumbbell shape. It is commonly known as dumbbell shape. And the one-to-one -one adherence is there and some kind of a chain. Always whenever we make the slides and see under microscope, we can see this chain-like structure with the spores. So single spore is dumbbell shape elongated spores. And it produces episodics in immature stages as well as the adult get infected. 
So what we are doing is we are multiplying it in rice grains, that is the solid medium, or we can multiply in coconut, simple coconut water also, that is the waste uh, water in copper making industry. That coconut water also we can uh, use as a very good medium for multiplication of metrosium. So these packets are grown in rice medium. And you can see that rice totally covered with the GMO spores. And when the, uh, how it is acting is that in the breeding sites, uh, when we apply the metarhysium, the grubs happen to the crawling grubs happen to get in touch with the metarhysium. It uh, grows inside and causes the uh, death of the uh, grubs. And finally, it mummifies and the spores uh, uh, come outside. And these uh, grubs again will be uh, act as the carrier for further multiplication of metarhysium. So the very uh, encouraging thing is that these spores can survive to more than one year in the breeding site. So a single application is enough for uh, treating the breeding sites. Another important biocontrol agent, what we are using for uh, this rhinoceros beetle management is a virus that is known as Orictus rhinoceros nudivirus. And this virus inv invades the nuclei of midgut epithelium and fat bodies of grubs and adults. And, uh, the major symptom is that the midgut get filled with a fluid. Here you can see two grubs. In one of the grub, you can see the mid dorsal line, that is the foot filled midgut. And the other grub that is absent, so uh, that is clear, uh, there is no line here. So this line, this one is a healthy grub, this is the infected grub. And if the infected grub, when you dissect it out, you can see that midgut filled with a fluid. So this midgut is filled with the viral fluid. What we are doing is here is this part of the midgut, we dissect it out, macerate with the uh, insect saline, and then feed the healthy grubs. And these healthy grubs we keep as the uh, source of inoculum for further multiplication. And the adult can be inoculated by either by orally feeding or allowing them to uh, wade in the inoculum. And the adult get the infection and we keep the adult for two, three days for the virus to multiply in their gut and release the adult in the breeding site. So here the method is, it is called as auto transmission that uh, this particular Orectus rhinoceros nudivirus, we cannot make it to a powder form like NPV or GV. Here what we have to do is that we have to inoculate the adult beetles and then release the adult beetles in the uh, pest infested plantation. So the rate is 10 to 12 beetles per hectare. This also is very effective technology because it is very specific for rhinoceros beetle. Then another major pest is uh, red palm weevil. It is an internal tissue borer and here this uh, uh, is a pest of a coconut, date palm in Middle East, oil palm and even now arachnid palm is infested by this pest. And uh, it's a very, uh, very pesty. can kill the palm and the annual loss accounts for about one crore, 140 crore rupees in our nation. One to two percent of coconut palms affected in endemic areas and ETL is single palm infestation, economic threshold level. Even a single palm is infested, you have to take the man uh, pest management strategies. And biology of this pest is completed within the palm. So you may be just, uh, you just rem uh, remember that in the case of rhinoceros beetle, only the adult is the damaging stage. Grubs are seen in the cow dung or compost or decaying organic matter. But in the case of red palm weevil, all the stages, all the egg to adult, all the stages are seen inside the healthy palm. So the feeding by the, uh, the larvae has 10 instars and the larval period about 7 to 85 days, very long larval period, and larvae are active feeders, and they feed inside the growing cabbage portion of the palm and result in toppling down of the palm. So what is here also, what is the reason that attract the adult for egg laying or attracting to coconut? Of course, very healthy and uh, palms are not attracted for egg laying. The reason is that the, there, may, there should be some kind of a rotting or some kind of a fermenting smell from the palm. Then only the weevil will come and lay eggs. So that there are many fungal diseases in coconut. 
just like a uh, leaf rot and bud rot you can see here and this is the leaf rot infested uh, plant tissue and here you can see the eggs so it lays eggs there is a, a small oval shape uh, uh, eggs are laid on the rotten tissues and egg will hatch in a day and the grubs get entry into the palm cabbage portion another reason is that cuts and injuries on the palm just like in some part of uh, the country the, we have the habit of cutting steps for climbing or sometimes some other mechanical injury also any kind of an injury on the palm attract the weevil for egg laying another is rhinoceros beetle damage this kind of a damage on the spear leaf region attract the weevils for egg laying then were these uh, uh, actually egg, uh, eggs are laid or what is the um, pest entry sites? First and most important is palm crown. Palm crown, pest entry through the palm crown. The main reason is rhinoceros beetle damage or the fungal infection like leaf rot and bud rot. Then leaf axils also, that also uh, is the another entry site. Here also rhinoceros beetle uh, is a culprit that makes the holes and the red palm will lay sex there. Then another is bold region. That mainly in juvenile palms and new hybrids and dwarf varieties, these kind of, some kind of a mechanical uh, uh, palm uh, operations in the farm, some kind of cuts and wounds in the uh, lower part uh, um, make uh, these kind of injuries attract the weevils for egg laying. And uh, definitely there are infestation symptoms like holes on the stem, then oozing out of a fluid from the coconut palm, splitting of lower coconut petiole. So that is the major symptom, especially in the waterlogged area when they plant the coconut. Uh, initial stages, the plant growth will be very, very, very big ball and like that. But when there is a drought, there will be a shrinking of the coconut uh, uh, trunk itself and it results in splitting of the lower petiole. There the uh, red palm will come and lay eggs. Another symptom is that the uh, wilting of spear leaf. That uh, is the another common symptom uh, seen in this red palm weevil infestation. And mostly the problem is that Farmers identify these symptoms when the palm finally toppled down. That case, when the head, the only single crown is there, it is the um, uh, no branches in coconut. So what happened when the crown topples, we cannot do anything. So that is the very late stage. For integrated uh, pest management uh, also here, Sustained surveillance and removal of dead palms is very important because the dead palm, uh, when the palm is infested by these uh, beetles, uh, weevils, uh, uh, continued uh, feeding and damage result in toppling down of the palm. Then farmers leave these toppled or dead palms as such. So it become again the breeding grounds for the next two or three generations. So first and foremost important is removal of dead palms from the palm, palm hygiene. Then prophylactic leaf axle filling, what we were doing for rhinoceros, it also stands good for rhinoceros beetle as well as red palm weevil. Curative treatment with the pesticides, then avoiding injuries on the trunk and pheromone trapping. And whatever it may be, the rhinoceros beetle or red palm weevil, these are active flyers and always uh, community-based uh, 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 approach should be there. Single farmer approach will not work very good for these kind of uh, pest management actions. Here, whenever the petioles are cut, that is also an important uh, thing to be remembered. Whenever the petioles cut, close cutting of the petiole attract a kind of injury here. And here the uh, weevil can come and lay eggs and the uh, eggs will hatch and it will gain entry into the palm within one or two days. But if you are leaving a petiole length of one meter to the palm, what happens here also a cut is there. The weevil can come and lay eggs here, but by the time the grubs hatch out and they slowly move to the palm trunk by the time this petiole get dry. So the uh, grubs also uh, will not develop further or will not gain entry into the uh, main trunk of the palm. So this is the simple technique that uh, we have to follow for uh, IPM uh, practice of red palm weevil. 
I was telling that the dead palms we have to remove always from the plantation because this this is a particular dead palm. So the palm is dead and still it is green, and so the soft tissues are still inside, and the weevils coming out will move to the next neighboring palm. So always we had seen that a fivefold increase in uh, pest infestation if a single palm, dead palm, is not removed from the vicinity. Prophylactic leaf axils filling, what I was telling for rhinoceros beetle, it holds good for here also. The same practice we have to follow for pest management here. Then curative treatment, I was telling what we have to use, what kind of a chemical. So now you may be knowing that so many chemicals were uh, in the totally pest management earlier, uh, 60s, 70s, like that. So many chemicals were recommended for different crops. But many of them are phased out now due to all the red labeled pesticides are banned like that. So we had a, a certain kind of experiments and we found that uh, the best one for a uh, red palm weevil management is imidacloprid followed by spinosad and intoxocarb. And uh, all these resulted to 70 to 90% recovery of red palm weevil infested palms. So how to apply? We have to apply where the injury is there. So as I, I have told that there will be some uh, holes on the stem and oozing of liquid from the holes. So the pesticide has to be applied through the holes to the inside of the palm. So we can use either funnel or the lance of the sprayers, or we can even pour through the spear leaf region if the damage is through the spear leaf. And within two weeks, we can see that a new spindle is coming out. And pheromone trapping, here also certain kind of pheromones are available. So that is 4-methyl 5-nanonol. Do any of you remember what was the pheromone for a, a rhinoceros beetle? It was ethyl 4-methyl octonate. Here this ferrolure plus, that is 4-methyl is 5-nanonol. So this is not in PVC trap. We are using it bucket trap. And one trap per five hectare in community-based approach is the strategy, but it is not the single solution for a red palm weevil incidence. It can be integrated as one of the component in IPM. Here, the weevil catches a higher amount of females than males, and proper handling and servicing of traps is very important. Earlier, we were using in capillary wells, then um, these uh, particular pheromones were then loaded in nanoporous uh, matrix and uh, it resulted in slow release and higher longevity of these pheromones. Then uh, the new research uh, is still going on in search of some biocontrol agents for uh, management of red palm weevil also because uh, I, as I have already told you for rhinoceros beetle we have different biocontrol agents like uh, green muscadine fungus, that is metrysium and isoplease, then orictus rhinoceros nudivirus, then we have certain plants and all these things. But for red palm weevil, still we are using the chemical pesticides and we are doing research for such a biocontrol agents and we have identified certain agents like a high surviving EPN. What is EPN? Endemopathogenic nematode against rhinoceros, uh, 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 red palm weevil. So that is a stainer nema species, that is CPCRA, certain isolate name is there. So that had induced the very 100% mortality of the grubs in laboratory studies. And we are now at it for a field delivery of the CPN to the field. We are uh, trying to deliver to the field through the dead cadavers. Then uh, certain other area of research is Luffy neuron induced uh, adult uh, uh, larval pupil transformations. This also is a chitin inhibitor. You may be knowing that is lufineuron is a chitin inhibitor. So it induces some blister formation, softening of cuticle and abnormal adult weevil. So here also the strategy for field de delivery has to be developed. Another area uh, that can also be explored is gut microbiome of red palm weevil. At least some nine gut microbiomes were identified like Bacillus, Klebsiella, Serratia, like that. Each one has a particular uh, um, function for, uh, for the, uh, to do in the insect. 
So uh, by through some uh, gene modification, we can alter if any of this function, it will induce some kind of a aberration in the insect or growth regulation in the insect. So that is also a newer area where uh, of approach for IPM. Another important pest is a black headed caterpillar. Here also the pest can induce very severe crop loss like 40% crop loss in coconut and it uh, uh, means the continuous infestation in the means a large area of the plantation is infested and uh, uh, summer months it flare up like anything very quick uh, uh, pest population uh, increases very fast and uh, here the larvae feed on the chlorophyll contents only on the underside of the leaf, abaxial leaf surface, they feed on the chlorophyll contents and the upper ep epidermis is intact. This upper epidermis get dried and uh, get a scorching appearance for the plantation. Here, uh, uh, approximately two and a half months uh, total life cycle is there, egg to adult stage. Then here it is totally biocontrol, only biomanagement that we have very promising biocontrol agents like parasitoids, Gonios asnafandides, black on brevicornis. These two are larval parasitoids. Then we have the elasmus nefandidis for the pre-pupal stage, pupal parasitoids like breast chimerian acetoid, trichospilus pipivara, means a very good array of biocontrol agents are available or associated with the pest that we are making use for management of this pest. And uh, almost 100%, 95 to 98% pest suppression is uh, uh, possible within two years of pest, uh, this bioagent or parasitoid release. So how they are working is that uh, they lay eggs on the surface of this uh, uh, host and the, uh, within uh, 10 to 15 days, uh, the parasitoid larvae develop to their own adults and they multiply in the field. So once we apply an inoculative release is there, then uh, it is highly self-sustainable. They will multiply there itself. As, as far as the host is there, the parasitoid population will multiply. Once the host comes down, the parasitoid also will uh, keep a maintain minimum balance in the field. So this is a very good example of biological control. Maybe in our nation itself, we can say very proudly, we can say biocontrol is very working very well in coconut black-headed caterpillar. These are some of the plots I just want to show you how this work. This is the area in Karnataka called Ullal. Here you can see the plants were totally dried and within, but it as uh, you have to just remember, biocontrol is not fast active. It takes minimum six months for a, one month for one leaf to come. So each the old leaf has to or down, then the newer leaves get a, uh, that greenery to retain back or to come back. It takes minimum two years. And uh, here, similar in Padukere in Karnataka, then some areas in Kerala like uh, Kotayam, then Trivandrum. Then even we had done some ex uh, experiment in uh, Jajur area of Arsikere, Karnataka. Here also you can see that within one and a half to two years, the total greenery is back. Once all the outer wall of leaves, uh, dried leaf, fall off, then the new leaves and the uh, middle world, it gives a total uh, recovered appearance for the palm. Here you can see how they are releasing the goniosis on the palm trunk. At, uh, its uh, climber is not actually required. So we can release it on the trunk or we can just open the tubes in the field and the, the parasitoid get attracted to the adult uh, pest smell and it uh, uh, reaches the pest and then uh, lays eggs on the pest and control it. Then another pest is known as white grub. That is the subterranean pest. It is confined to sandy loan tracts of Kerala and Kar Karnataka mostly. Here you just remember the white grub infesting coconut is known as Leucophilus coniophora. So the grubs are also very big size. You may be knowing about holotrichy and other white grubs in uh, North India also, like sugar cane and groundnut, all uh, white grubs are major problem. Here, the particular white grubs in coconut are very big size, almost the size of rhinoceros beetle. And coconut white grub is known as Leucophilus coniophora. And here also it has an annual life cycle. Uh, egg to adult period is completed within one year. So the adult emergence occurs in May. 
after the first uh, pre monsoon showers the adults emerge out of the soil then active in the field for a, almost a one month but daily it goes inside the soil then it lays eggs uh, again in the soil then uh, the, all the other stages uh, eggs uh, larva pupa all completed uh, um, underneath only then again the next year may uh, june months the adult come out and uh, uh, that is that kind of an annual life cycle is there so symptoms are again uh, yellowing of leaves premature nutfall delayed flowering retardation and uh, crown tapering all some of these uh, external visible symptoms for uh, root grub infestation so for the management deep plowing during pre and post monsoon so why because uh, for that period uh, uh, approximately september october period the grubs will be in the third instar stage so if we can plow the interspaces the grubs get exposed and will be predated by the birds and other predators mechanical collection of beetle during peak emergence because as i had already told that the adult emergence is only due to a particular uh, period of the year month of the year just like may june and particular time only after sunset only it will emerge from the soil active in the soil for a one or two hours then go back to the soil so that particular time we, we know when it will be coming out so very easy for adult collection also application of neem cake in the coconut basin at the rate of 5 kg per palm for rejuvenating the root system then we have certain chemical like chlorpyrifos imidacloprid and bifenthrin for a uh, uh, root zone and uh, application for uh, uh, mainly aiming the first instar grubs and uh, the later grubs like uh, third instar and second instar grubs are managed by entomopathogenic nematodes like stainer rima carpocapsae in the at the rate of 1.5 billion ijs per hectare so it's very effective for white grub management entomopathogenic nematodes are very effective and uh, it is being used for coconut as well as in arachnid another pest is corid bug that is uh, uh, what to say we can say it is an emerging pest it is not a very common pest in all the areas especially in south kerala and certain tracts it's a major problem it is a sucking pest it uh, um, suck the juice in colonies the uh, uh, bug is uh, paradasinus rostratus it pierces its mouth part through the calyx region and suck the juice and the tightness of the calyx and the nut get loose and uh, nut fall occurs so the symptom is immature nut fall and management is by spraying the bunges through with the neem oil uh, 0.5% then the rat may, you may be knowing rat is a major nuisance and uh, uh, results in uh, tender nut drop and the the thing is that if the nut uh, is damaged by rat we can very well identify that is uh, circular uh, approximately 5 cm uh, diameter holes just below the calyx region that is the typical symptom of rat damaged nut and uh, management is uh, by different kind of traps and bands and all used the uh, or single dose anticoagulant rodenticide bromodilone wax cakes are used for management of rats these uh, wax cakes has to be kept in the because these are all arboreal rats it has to be kept on the crown uh, region in the infested Mm, pest infested palms then there are some minor pests i told you that uh, so many more than 800 species of insects are uh, visiting the palm one or the other time but at certain time very rarely these due to some ecological changes or some climate change or some uh, our uh, spraying for some other pest or something like that uh, sometimes these secondary pest emergence occurs and there are few examples like a uh, slack caterpillars in andhra pradesh and karnataka one species of slack caterpillar is macroplectra neraria another is contaila rotunda and parasalipida these are all like a uh, little grubs they are irritating also so very rarely uh, this kind of pest emergence occurs but uh, we can use light traps and, and then uh, bacillus spray and uh, collection and destruction of adult uh, by light trap also is very very effective in this kind of management but uh, uh, it's all uh, what to say it's not uh, spreading very fast it's in certain pockets it is there very easily we can manage also 
contain it within there itself. And there are, uh, these are all minor pests like uh, mealybugs uh, on coconuts, paddocks, and rattle. It's very rarely it attain a pest status. Then these are the scale insects. Scale insects in hot summer because our um, drought sometimes uh, 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 prevails in many areas and scale insects becomes a very major problem. And uh, in those areas, uh, we need not have to do anything because you can see the coccinellids and so many predators are there associated with the scale insect. So um, the scales are controlled naturally by these predators. So there is no need to be uh, spray anything or uh, no pesticide spray is required. These uh, um, chylochorus and so many other predators are there always associated with the scale insects. Then coming to the uh, other two crops like arachnidum uh, and uh, cocoa also we have to just uh, uh, go through. Arachnidum, uh, the major problem is spindle bug. Spindle bug, you can see the spindle region, you can see the brown lesions on the spindle region and when the spindle unfolds, you can see uh, uh, brown markings on the uh, opened leaf also. So the bugs desap the emerging spindle and tender leaves like uh, uh, sucking pest. Then uh, linear dark brown lesions will be there. And here you can see the how the bugs look like. Uh, it is a reddish and uh, uh, colored bug. And uh, the management is uh, placement of thiomethoxam uh, 2 gram in perforated small polythene sachet, just like the leaf axle filling for uh, um, coconut palm. Here we do the leaf axle filling for arachnid palm, but here we are using thiomethoxam. So that uh, in two gram, very small quantity, two grams in perfor perforated polythene sachet, small sachet, we have to make out of this uh, thiomethoxam and place in the leaf axils. Or we can give a very, a very small quantity, 0 0.25 gram per liter in the spray around the spindle region say, with the same thiomethoxam and regulation of shade in the garden is very important. Um, uh, shaded gardens and dwarf varieties are shows maximum uh, infestation. Then coming to root grub, you just remember Leucophilus coniophora was the uh, root grub for a coconut root grub, but uh, the root grub infesting arachnid is Leucophilus burmistry. So it looks almost the same. Uh, there are minor differences, but size and almost the same. Grubs and adult uh, almost look like Leucophilus uh, coniophora, but there is one more species, Leucophilus lepidophora. So all these three, uh, coconut and arachnid uh, mixed cropping systems also, all these three occurs, but uh, mainly the major species in arachnid is Leucophilus burmistry. Here also the arachnid uh, compared to coconut root system is very less. So the damage to the root system result in sometimes uh, yellowing of these palms and uh, reduction in yield. So here also uh, the management is almost like a coconut, ensuring good drainage and summer plowing, collection and destruction of beetles during emergence period, incorporation of neem cake. Here we are using two kilogram per palm per year. For coconut, we are using five kilogram per palm per year. Soil drenching EPN liquid formulation, liquid suspension. What is EPN? Endemopathogenic nematode. Here we are using stainer nema carpocapsae at the rate of 1.5 billion IJs per hectare during September, October, and a small dose of insecticide that is points 0.25 ml per liter of imidacloprid. It has a synergistic effect on EPN. This small dose of imidacloprid activates the EPN more and we get a more mortality of the white grubs. Then uh, early stages, when because the uh, adult white grub lay eggs uh, in all throughout the soil, not in the coconut base alone. So uh, the very early stages for at least for one month and all, it will be there in the feeding on the grass roots and all. So that kind, that time also we can give a very small uh, spray of a very small reduced dose, 0 0.25 ml per liter of imidacloprid in the interspaces also. And when it migrate to the coconut basin region, that time we can apply stainer nema and uh, imidacloprid. 
then mites are also sometimes a problem in arachnida white mite is oligonychus indicus and red mite is rauella indica here you can just to see the yellowing of leaves and drying of leaves underneath you can see the red colored mites so active during summer period and uh, short life completed within 15 days and uh, results in yellow specks and uh, drying of leaves the main thing is provide adequate shade for seedlings and uh, regulate irrigation then severe cases spraying neem oil emulsion 0.5% is recommended and there are so many natural enemies associated with the mite so indiscriminate spraying always has to be avoided another is arachnid inflorescence caterpillar that is known as tirataba mundella it damages the inflorescence and what happens is that inflorescence will not open on its own and get dried and then webs on the inflorescence and feeding uh, area dries up and mechanical injury by slugs uh, it results in further uh, another pest infestation also so here what we are doing is that affected spadixes may be opened and if one or two caterpillars are seen that has to be uh, removed and burned that is the best uh, option uh, to prevent the spread and in severe cases chlorpyrifos 0.04% spraying is recommended then coming to coco uh, coco uh, very few pests are there in coco one is uh, major one is mealy bug mealy bug infest the cherry leaves cherry leaves are very small coco uh, just the developing pods then the uh, flowers and the uh, new flushes new buds all these areas these mealy bugs infest uh, rarely it results in the drying of the Uh, cherry leaves and uh, uh, spindle region also so that are small flower buds and all then uh, so many natural enemies are also always associated with these mealy bugs like uh, spalgius apes and predatory coccinellids all these things it get take care of these uh, mealy bugs and uh, uh, in severe cases 0.5% neem oil or imidacloprid 0.3 ml per liter any one of this is recommended for management but only spot application in case of severe infestation the major pest of coco is merit bug helopeltis species you may be knowing helopeltis as a major pest of cashew and it has of late it has become a major pest of coco also there are actually three species of um, um, helopeltis this is uh, commonly known as tea mosquito bugs so this helopeltis uh, main species is helopeltis antoni helopeltis thebora and helopeltis brady and helopeltis antoni is the main species in uh, uh, cashew and here in coco uh, the major species infesting coco is helopeltis brady so low infestation of helopeltis antoni and thebora also noticed uh, but uh, there is a, a difference in the elevation of uh, coco plantation uh, difference in species complex also so these are all uh, means uh, advanced topics uh, needs more time for discussion and all so helopeltis brady uh, these merits attack the cherry leaves these are the cherry leaves means very small developing coco pods then uh, feeding lesions on cherry leaves results in drying up of cherry leaves sometimes drying up the new flushes and uh, new buds then uh, in the mature pods also it uh, suck the juice from these pods and result in some kind of a drying of these uh, pods and very difficult for uh, opening and uh, very poor growth of the um, seeds will be there inside and spraying lambda silothrin uh, 0.3 ml per liter or imidacloprid 0.25 ml per liter is uh, recommended in case of very severe infestation then here rodents also is a major problem for coco here by the pattern of damage we can identify whether it is rats or squirrels rats as in case of coconut rats always damage the uh near the stock region they make the holes and uh, feed the contents inside and in the case of squirrels they always makes the holes in the middle part so by seeing these damage reports we can identify whether it is by a rat or by squirrel so management is rat can be controlled by keeping bromodilone wax cakes in the branches the branches of rat infested trees uh, at an interval of 10 to 12 days to twice trapping is very effective and squirrels can be controlled by wooden or wire mesh traps only and 
the timely harvest of ripe pod is the more important thing the timely harvest if you are removing the ripe pod at the correct time then the infestation we can reduce and just keeping it in the field it again gives food for these organisms and they multiply plantation sanitation and here also just like any for plantation crops all always for any pest management community approach is uh, very ideal then thrips and uh, the pod borers also become just like coconut uh, mealybugs and all these things here thrips and uh, these sometimes pod borers also uh, are seen these are all minor pest and a very low level infestation is there thrips uh, we need not have to do anything because uh, the in, inside of uh, seeds are not affected but conogethus punctiferalis that is the pod borer sometimes bore inside uh, and uh, make some damage here the thing is that uh, whenever we um, encounter with uh, such kind of damage uh, better to remove that one just mechanical collection is enough so i just want to sum up that uh, you are uh, agri graduates and you will be selecting for your uh, uh, specialization for your uh, pg studies and for further research or further job there are a lot of job opportunities also in entomology just like uh, uh, mass production of biogens that is a very good uh, uh, area for you to work and uh, uh, biocontrol uh, laboratory building new biocontrol laboratories that is always uh, uh, that will be a uh, scope is there then there is always scope for because we have to create a database for everything so trained persons are always required and uh, pro programs protocols and languages required uh, because uh, the research going someplace and elsewhere bioinformatics and these kind of things uh, that only uh, will strengthen our the research so that kind of uh, opportunities will be there educating in public farmers that also is more important and uh, just i want to mention that uh, because we are also uh, just uh, here I, I am mentioning about the uh, existing pest what were the indigenous pest but uh, uh, next class we will be having that on the invasive pest so one if an invasive pest invade our crop we have to sometimes bring natural enemy from its its own native place so that kind of an import of natural enemy is required there is only one agency approved in india that is the national bureau of agricultural insect resources bangalore so through them only we can import the natural enemy then we have to quarantine within the laboratories then release in the field that's why i want for your knowledge is just i want to share that one so i thank you uh, so much uh, you all participants uh, i wish you all the very best and uh, very uh, safe and healthy time ahead and uh, uh, i wish everything uh, best in your uh, future also i wish uh, you all success in your studies and the career and i thank dr jayesh grant team for giving this wonderful opportunity to share my uh, views with these uh, young graduates thank you thank you thanks a lot ma'am uh, my sincere gratitude to you uh, for your knowledge and interesting presentation and also for uh, signaling the career opportunities uh, in this uh, arena so uh, i'll just open my video also so uh, uh, participants you can unmute if you have any queries and uh, uh, you can ask questions now the discussion forum is open there there are some questions in the chat groups also if there are uh, there is any live uh, questions you have then you can raise it now or else we will uh, go to the chat box good evening ma'am this is p banu prasad from dr vaisa horticulture university andhra pradesh just i have, have a question uh, when we go for the plowing the plowing for removal of white grass uh, in case of coconut uh, if the fibrous root systems are damaged it will uh, attract the ml wasps that will cause a root wilt which is highly prevalent in western tract so is there any other method for removal of this uh, white grass okay very good question actually the root uh, root wilt is not root is wilting <laughs> so that is a very good question uh, i think you will have a class on uh, your disease also disease aspects are so coconut you know this very particular it root is only up to 2 meters so the uh, that is the that is owned by coconut the basin so the inner spaces what we mean is beyond that area so that uh, uh, the major roots are confined within 2 meters so that we are not disturbing at all 
and uh, we are not uh, and even if some roots are cut uh, new ones will uh, regenerate from that part also because uh, uh, in the white grub infested uh, white grub is infesting the roots only so many roots will be uh, damaged in that process of feeding so the new roots will come about if you give proper like we are giving neem cake and all that all kind of health management for the palm that will rejuvenate the root system itself and the uh, root wilt for your information is not uh, the roots are not actually in root wilt infested palm you can see that uh, decaying of roots but it is spread through a vector this is a phytoplasma uh, is the causative agent and is spread through a vector so that has nothing to do with actually with the root but uh, it uh, respond well to the management practices so other uh, for white grapes the best method is collection of adult through light trap or even manual collection works very well because we know particularly when it is going to happen uh, may suppose if you are getting one or two rains in may last uh, particular days then we can very well wait uh, maybe in four or five days the adults will be coming at what time of course after sunset for one and a half hour or something like that so even uh, school going children and all can uh, collect and because in the northeast uh, one region they were uh, they were uh, making it as a festival root root means kokcha uh, for collections adult and even they were frying and eating it those uh, adult uh, uh, beetles so that kind of uh, adult collection is a very good uh, thing and uh, endema pathogenic nematodes are working very well 100% well and uh, cpcra has developed uh, some stainer nema formulation a co formulation and uh, here i just want to tell that um, uh, they are uh, we had uh, out, uh, means uh, commercialized it uh, many firm, firms have taken this a co formulation from us and uh, they are multiplying it so it is available to the farmers also ma'am um, another question Uh, when you go for the study of uh, gut microbia, gut microbes of red palm beetle, uh, how do we go for? Uh, and if we change their uh, gene uh, so that it uh, may cause any negative effect to the red palm beetle, how will we just uh, infect it to the other? Uh, Maybe, can you put in the chat? Uh? Yes, uh, Baru, there is a there, there is a lot of disturbance actually. Uh, I don't know what is exactly. So, uh, I will mean, put it in the chat box. Huh? Yeah, you can put in the chat box to that. Yeah. Okay. The first question, what I can see here is, uh, can you explain how gene editing technology is applicable in controlling the red palm beetle? Uh, of course, um, uh, that is uh, gene silencing method. Uh, that is, uh, uh, we have just initiated in it. Dr. Uh, M. K. Rajesh uh, is doing it at uh, CPCRA Kasar Goda with red palm beetle and. Uh, so that is in the laboratory stage now and uh, your next uh, our next speaker dr joseph rajkumar he will be um, discussing with you on friday i think so he, i last came to explain because it takes some more time and uh, to include that one in his uh, uh, lecture uh, that is we are at it we are, we are just initiated that kind of phase central rhinoceros beetle okay so that i had seen in many nowadays you know that the media is spreading very fast with the is it audible hello hello ma'am audible ma'am yes okay. ma'am it's audible yeah, okay okay so in tamil nadu in certain part uh, certain south indian state this technology is uh, use uh, means in practice but uh, personally there is no uh, experimental evidence to show that uh, it's uh, working very well or it is uh, compatibly better technology than something else but it is all farmers indigenous knowledge and uh, uh, maybe working in some places but we don't have a scientific base to uh, say that uh, this much is the quantity this much you have to do things like that or 
particular uh, season of the year it works very well or uh, or that kind of a uh, scientific touch is not available for that one excuse me okay ma'am uh, you said that rectus rhinoceros nudivirus yeah. should be inoculated in a rhinoceros beetle yeah. where those kind of beetles will be available for farmers yeah we can collect these beetles using using the pheromon trap that will whether that will be inoculated with this virus yeah that we can use for inoculating the virus and we can release in the field otherwise itself in the farm you can see the cow dung pits and composting uh, uh, tanks and all and dead coconut logs there also you just see in the decaying stage that uh, grubs and uh, pupae and adults all will be there so you can just uh, collect it from there also or else you can use uh, some kind of a trapping methods for collecting the adults because the adults you just give some feed you know they will you can keep it for 3 to 4 months so when enough adults are there we can inoculate and then release in the field and another one ma'am yes please ma'am you said that the, the black headed caterpillar uh, pest outbreaks comes in high temperature and relative humidity yeah uh, that that means you are uh, you are focusing on the drought condition i am from velur tamil nadu okay. here i cannot get uh, enough water supply and there may be chances for drought stress also how i could manage the Manage you know those. it uh, this black headed caterpillar is pest of coconut only not are not infesting arachnid so mm. if there is any infestation because in tamil nadu andhra pradesh karnataka all this area enough for demonstrations and a large area area wide demonstrations are already conducted by uh, all india coordinated research project centers and universities and all everywhere it is 100% successful only thing is that at initial stages you have to identify and you have to just see where uh, these parasitoids are available uh, in tamil nadu aliyar nagar center is having a very good biocontrol laboratory and the tnau center also headquarters also may be having so like that uh, uh, many madurai center may be having so like that uh, you have to just in, uh, contact the person who is multiplying the parasitoids kerala you know the system is uh, very well developed for that one we have some nan parasite breeding stations under state department of agriculture karnataka also so many parasite breeding stations are available under state department of agriculture so the farmer has to get in contact with the first agriculture officer then the parasite breeding stations and they can release in the field but uh, arachnid uh, this pest is not particular pest black headed caterpillar is not infesting arachnid only for coconut so we have to just see we have to monitor if because if there is a history previous history then there is a chance of uh, again a pest attack in the coming seasons so if previous years during drought a pest attack was there then after uh, some rainy period it will come down then again september october november we have to monitor the field so november onwards if pest population is uh, on the slowly building up then immediately we have to release and we can prevent from coming to a very high uh, pest emergence ma'am also i want to know how the high temperature and relative humidity because the uh, pest is seen very near to water bodies so high temperature and uh, that is why it is uh, both correlated positive uh, just like uh, uh, near lakes river beds and uh, then sometimes in coastal areas so the uh, it is uh, population build up is very high especially in andhra pradesh uh, the population is very high in uh, coconut grown on uh, buns near the ponds and all so that kind of a near to, uh, proximity to water body is uh, seen as a, uh, what to say maybe the higher humidity reason thank you ma'am thank you you welcome yeah uh, this dimethylate and the chlorpyrifos chemicals are banned okay so now there is a question uh, there is a discussion going on banning 17 agrochemicals uh, and uh, dimethate of course uh, is banned uh, no, not banned for use in coconut and arachnid uh, i don't know whether i have put the dimethate in some of the slides uh, di- so uh, maybe uh, my mistake only uh, so in that case we are using uh, for uh, spindle bug thiomethoxam 
and the chlorpyrifos also it is in the banning list only so alternative we are trying because uh, some of these uh, pesticides like chlorpyrifos uh, uh, we are using now dimethyl uh, bifenthrin so uh, i am very sorry for thiamethox uh, dimethyl it was there uh, i don't think that i had put dimethyl in the slides uh. Uh, question is that dimethyl and chlorpyrifos are uh, banned so uh, of course it will be banned uh, government will be banning those uh, chemicals that in the list some discussions are going on uh, so that uh, 17 new are there so almost uh, uh, these things are in the list only when we manipulate the gut microbiome how can we infect them to other insects and it is not possible to infect all the weevils so that is the that kind of a, a um, what to say uh, we have to feed the insect with this modified diet with these things and then release in the field because that is the uh, not an immediate uh, This kind of things for pest management, but uh, at present it is not in a state. And uh, my uh, colleague Dr. Joseph Rajkumar also is a part of that kind of a research, so you can discuss with him more about uh, what stage uh, we are at it now. Uh, next class, uh, that uh, IPM class will be continued in the next session yeah. also. Friday uh, we will be conducting that. Okay. Friends, any more questions? Uh, some more in chat groups? Yeah, there is. In between, the server was uh, put off. Uh, because the uh, earlier uh, questions yeah. are not visible. Here. Not, not visible. That's uh, some, even I uh, am <laughs> unable to. If there were some questions in the chat box because uh, there was a problem in the uh, server. Uh, so. I have mentioned my phone number in my first slide. I don't know. Uh, or else you can give them also. So in future also, if they have any doubt, they oh, are... Oh, now you can uh, keep it in the chat box, man. I mean, okay. now itself. Uh, or I, I can okay, write okay, it. I'll, I'll put that. Okay, okay. Otherwise, also, you know, the live streaming is open. Uh, the presentation is available for a few more days than the live stream. If you have any further doubt, you can call me also anytime. Ah, yes, ma'am. It is. I'm very happy that. Uh, Students are interested in the festival. That is, that is, this is actually, uh, they were very reluctant to ask questions and all. This is a good forum. Actually, they have to uh, have this practice of asking questions. No? Yeah, asking yeah, yeah, questions yeah. is very important uh, for their career also. Uh, yeah. That inhibition should be shut down. Uh, thing is that no, it was only limited for one hour, so I I don't know. I was just hurrying through the things to complete, uh, so I was okay, not able to concentrate on each of the things like that. No, we, we have these limitations anyway, but then yeah. uh, we have done okay. a wonderful job actually. Uh, even uh, it is, of course, uh, you have to skip some of the things now without much detailing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we are continuing with the university test on Friday. That will be a complete yeah. package if time think, uh, permits. Uh, yeah. I uh, that one because I had skipped some of the things and I just want uh, Joseph to handle those things because he was dealing with it himself. Absolutely. Uh, so. And more, more, more than this, the students, uh, they are getting a personal rapport with uh, the scientists and all. That is another uh, kind of a linkage. Also, they can, that's why we are giving the phone number and uh, all the details. You can contact, uh, we're free to contact. So, I think we can, uh, we shall call it a day now. <laughs> Uh, once again, thank you very much, Chandrika, ma'am. Yes. Thanks a lot, and thank, thank thanks a lot all, for the, yeah. all my best wishes to the students, dear students. Yeah, that's great. Okay, ma'am. Then see you. Okay. Thank you. okay.